reading from Ezekiel 36, beginning in verse 22. Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. This is the word of the Lord from Ezekiel 36. Our New Testament scripture is from the book of Galatians, a letter of the Apostle Paul written to the churches in the Roman province of Galatia. And if you're following along the Sanctuary Bible, that text is located on page 1815. And by the way, our uh, sermon series uh, that's just beginning, started last week, is uh, Life in the Spirit, Living in the Spirit, referring to our life in the Holy Spirit. And this is a reading from Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 13. The Apostle Paul wrote, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit desires what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Beloved of God, this is the Word of God. Thanks be to God.
We just heard, read, an almost 2,000 year old description of two lifestyles that didn't stop in the first century. These two different kinds of lifestyles, two ways of living are present on, of all days, Mother's Day and every day. Two ways of living actually describe two kinds of faith. Do we trust in ourselves or do we trust in God and the power of the Holy Spirit working within us? In the first description, This means that because of everything Jesus did on the cross, when he was buried, when he uh, was raised from the dead, when he was taken back up into heaven, uh, all this restores us, humankind, all believers in Jesus Christ, into God's family. Father, Son, Spirit, and all of the brothers and sisters of Jesus, all the children of God, all the human temples who are filled and in whom resides the Holy Spirit. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, which was a really bad, immoral place to live in that time, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. Whatever we do, whatever we eat, whatever we drink, whatever we say, whatever we think, whatever we do, God calls his children to glorify God. So that second list of the fruit of the Spirit are to be seen as supernatural effects, supernatural works that the Spirit of God does in and through us. In other words, the idea that the Apostle is getting across is that uh, human beings can't produce these supernatural effects in solely human power using human resources. In order to produce spiritual fruit, we need to allow the Holy Spirit, who resides in all those who believe in Christ, to produce 
the fruit of the Spirit. The love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the gentleness, the goodness, the self-control that we can't produce, especially in situations where the old sinful nature is provoked. When somebody nearly runs you off the road on the street, the first words out of your mouth typically aren't, oh, I'm so sorry that person's driving like that. Typically, well, I, we're in church, I, I can't say what might be the first words that might come out of our mouth. So, ever since the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church on that first uh, Pentecost Sunday, which we will celebrate in a, in a couple weeks here, everything will be decorated in red, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll turn over these pyramids, and the color red will symbolize uh, the fire of the Holy Spirit, because when the Spirit was poured out upon the church, uh, what it looked like, in addition to the sound of like a tornado, tongues of fire were resting above all the heads of all the believers. And then they began to speak in foreign languages they didn't even know, uh, proclaiming the gospel, the good news that God loves us and in Jesus Christ died for our sins, who rose from the dead and who transforms us to be God's children through faith in him. You and I are all alike. All people everywhere are all alike. We have a choice before us to live in the world's way of living, to pursue the natural desires, however immoral they may be of our flesh, or to pursue the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's your choice and mine as it always has been ever since the Spirit of God was given to the church almost 2,000 years ago. This is a tension. It's an invisible tension within us because all believers have living within another person. You could even go so far as to say Believers in Jesus Christ are possessed not by a bad person, a demon. We are possessed by God's Spirit. In other words, we are owned by God. We've been redeemed. We've been purchased at the price of the life of Jesus Christ and his shed blood. Therefore, we belong to God. We are God's children. We belong in God's family. We belong in God's church through faith in Jesus Christ. And this tension exists our whole life long. So whenever we encounter a situation where, you know, let's say we, we left church on a Sunday afternoon, had lunch, we're driving home, and somebody swerves across the lane into our lane, almost hits our car, you have a choice right? What's going to come out? The natural way of responding in a situation like that or with the fruit of the Spirit? The supernatural, God-empowered, God-sourced response. It's your decision and mine. The Galatian churches, and for that matter, churches all over the Roman Empire from the first century until our current time, have lived with this tension. And to the degree to which God's word was taught and explained and applied, Christians have learned how not to get sucked into the culture around us in the world, but how to become more like Jesus Christ by relying not on our human resources alone, but by relying on God, the Holy Spirit. And our resources and our abilities, our talents, the good ones, are God-given. So God gives us gifts, not only our human abilities and talents and experiences, uh, good things, but the gift of the Holy Spirit. And of course, all this made possible through what Paul described as the indescribable gift 
of Jesus Christ to humankind. And for all who believe, we have the God-given power, the God-given source of power, the God-given Spirit of God to enable us, to empower us, to resist temptation and to obey whatever God wants us to do in any moment, in any situation. So Christianity is often misunderstood. It's just another religion where you just try your best, try to be better than other people around you. You know, do your best to follow the golden rule. Go to church, you know, read your Bible, and good luck. But that's not what Christianity is. Christianity, as J.B. Phillips, a biblical scholar, C.S. Lewis, and others describe as a relationship. See, in none of the other world religions is there an intimate, eternal relationship promised and assured as a result of trusting in God. It's just not available. Only Christianity assures all who believe in Jesus Christ that we have a relationship with God that begins in this life and never ends. And... It's like the TV commercials, but wait, there's more. And we are given the fullness of the Holy Spirit to enjoy that relationship, a life of joy, love, peace, kindness, not a life described as the human uh, old sinful nature is described, full of rage and uh, selfish ambition and jealousy and envy and drunkenness, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you may have heard of the author Leroy Imes. I understand he worked with a Christian organization called the Navigators. In his book, The Lost Art of Disciple Making, he uh, wrote this story, it's a true story. One spring break, our family was driving from Fort Lauderdale to Tampa, Florida. And as far as the eye could see, orange trees were everywhere loaded with fruit. But when we stopped for breakfast at a restaurant, I ordered orange juice with my eggs. But the waitress said, I'm sorry, I can't bring you orange juice today. Our machine is broken. At first I was dumbfounded. Here we were surrounded by millions of oranges, and I knew they had oranges in the kitchen, in fact, cartons full of Florida orange juice. But I couldn't have a drop. Why? Because the dispensing machine for the orange juice was broken. The problem wasn't that there was no orange juice. We were surrounded by millions of gallons of orange juice. The problem was the connection. How to get the orange juice from the orange on the tree onto the breakfast table in a glass. So the metaphor of how it works with us in our relationship with God, the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God is omnipresent. He's all present, he's everywhere. The Spirit of God is all-knowing. He knows you better than we know ourselves. And the Spirit of God is all-powerful. He can do anything that God, that He wants to do. Why don't we experience the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present Holy Spirit all the time? The answer, the machine gets broken. There's a disconnect between the indwelling Holy Spirit who resides within us 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, nonstop, and whether or not we consciously trust in the Holy Spirit to enable us, to empower us, what God, whatever God wants us to do, which of course is always in alignment with God's word. So what Leroy Imes and others point out is our 
natural human inclination to do things our way for our own needs apart from God's gracious, all-sufficient power and presence to help us to do so. Jesus said, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Now Jesus was talking about a vineyard, and he uh, compared himself using a metaphor of the vine. He said, um, uh, my father is the vine, I am the vine dresser. Whoever uh, abides in me and I be, uh, abide in him bears much fruit. But those who do not abide in me, are cut off, branches are cut off, and they don't bear much fruit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, the lifestyle, the characteristics, the personality traits, and the behaviors of Jesus Christ, are ours in abundance if we allow the Holy Spirit of God to abide in us and to empower us to do God's will. So love, you all know what these are. Love, you know what joy is, you know what peace is, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. The characteristics of the life of Christ are ours. They're fruit God gives us and produces within and through us as we rely upon the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. In the book of Psalms, the very first Psalm, uh, written hundreds of years before the life of Christ, we find the same theme, the same teaching. Blessed are those who do not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord and they meditate on God's law day and night. They are like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season. Their leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They will not stand in judgment. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. But the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will lead to destruction. My sermon could be summed up in one sentence. You are just like Jesus to the extent that you choose to allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through you. So the question is, who do we really want to be? And how do we want to be like Jesus in our own power or through the power of the Spirit? The Gospel is really good news. It's good news that God wants and desires you and I and all those who trust in Christ to become each and every day more and more like the Savior in our love for one another and our love for others outside the church and of course our love for God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Here's another way of looking at the uh, life in the Holy Spirit and how the fruit of the Spirit, the, the personality traits of Jesus uh, are produced in and through our lives. Uh, author and theologian James Packer, in his book, Keep in Step with the Spirit, describes the inner life of the believer as a conscious fellowship with a person, namely the Holy Spirit, whose presence within us from day to day, moment by moment, leads us to do as Christ would have us to do, to obey the words of Jesus, not only to do what pleases God, but to do so in the power of God.
Whoever said that Christianity was all our responsibility apart from a life walking with the Spirit, living with the Spirit? God's word is clear. Living with the Spirit was God's idea all along. God's desires for you, God's plan for your life. And in eternity, we will continue to live with the Holy Spirit and, of course, in God's kingdom with, with his son Jesus and God and all believers, all of our loved ones and family and friends who preceded us in going from this life to the life to come. James Packer went on to describe how the Holy Spirit works within us writing that the Spirit is like a floodlight shining on a building in the dark of night, making the edifice visible in the midst of the darkness. However, the precise location of a well-landscaped building is hidden. The floodlights are hidden from view. So Packer writes, the Holy Spirit is like those hidden floodlights shining on the Savior from within our lives. And the life of Christ is produced not by human effort, but by the Holy Spirit imparting and producing the life of Christ within us. Packer concludes by saying the Spirit's role is to help us and empower us to glorify Christ, not himself, and to make us aware of all that Jesus is so that we will come to trust Christ in every aspect of our lives. You might think of the fruits of the Holy Spirit in this way. God has set out a feast before you. It's a table, a cornucopia, loaded with wonderful, delicious things that we are to partake in, to absorb, and to share. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we can think of the Holy Spirit also as a uh, indwelling resident gardener. So if we think of our souls as, using a metaphor, uh, garden soil, we can think of the Holy Spirit as the one who tends it and who waters and who puts uh, nutrients in the soil. And of course, the sunlight, the light of Christ, causes the fruit to grow. So like the jingle in... uh, the bank commercial or the credit card commercial, what's in your wallet? What sign is in the garden soil of your life? Does the sign say, keep out? Or does the sign say, help me God, I need you to do this because I can't do it myself. It's kind of a long sign to read, but. So, Let me close with this question. What's for dinner? What's for dinner? The fruit of the human, sinful, broken, fallen nature? Or the fruit of the Spirit of God? As we close this time uh, in God's Word in our worship service, I invite you to uh, bow your hearts in prayer.